Um, all right. Yeah, my name is Justin. I'm going to be doing a presentation on chapter one of Marx's Capital. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so to start out with a bit of an introduction, uh, why is capital important? And why are we only covering chapter one in this educational, right? So capital, and particularly volume one, provides us with a theory of capitalist production and beyond just a theory, but a critique of political economy as a theoretical field. So often we hear that, you know, the ideas presented in capital are outdated or they no longer apply to our version of capitalism, right? Capitalism as we experience it today. But although Marx wrote capital in the 1860s and 1870s, I think that his argument in the book is at such a high level of abstraction that it, it doesn't just apply to the capitalism that existed when he was writing it, but also to the capitalism that we have today. And that was exactly his goal, right? He didn't want to, he didn't want to show off a particular, a particular historical manifestation, but rather the fundamental laws that would exist in any of its manifestations. And then the second question is why only chapter one is educational, right? Because it's, it's a huge book of like, five, 600 pages. And chapter one is maybe 50 pages out of that entire book. But I think that in my opinion, chapter one is probably the most important chapter. And it's also the most difficult to understand. I think that, you know, often people get through maybe like the first seven pages to where Marx starts talking about the forms of exchange or the, the value form analysis. And they kind of give up, like after reading about socially necessary labor time, they're like, oh, okay, I know everything about Marx's theory of value. But I think that this is the wrong thing to do. I think that, you know, the end of the chapter really helps pull the whole thing together. And I think that getting a good understanding of chapter one will help you get a good understanding of the entirety of the book and what Marx is trying to do. So hopefully in devoting like an hour of time to it, rather than attempting to cram in a bunch of chapters in an hour, we can give this chapter the respect it deserves. Although I still think that with even an hour, I'm not gonna be able to do it justice and that even better would be reading the chapter yourself. Another thing that I wanna talk about in the introduction are the dates of publication. So in general, for any work, I think that it's important to place it in the historical context that it was written in. So not only the events that occurred around that time period, Right, and the situation that the author was responding to, but also in the in the in the case of Marx, where his writings span decades from what what's often referred to as young Marx to older, more economic Marx, we should also look to place his individual works chronologically in the timeline of everything he's written. Right. And one example of that uh, is that I often see people recommend value, price, and profit to people that, that are trying to understand capital because it's a really short pamphlet. I think it's like 10 pages or something. And it's often said like, oh, if you wanna understand capital or you want like an intro to capital, read this. But I think that's not exactly right because value, price and profit was written in 1865, which as we can see here is like eight, 10 years before Marx's last edition of volume one that he personally oversaw. So, and I think abstracting from this and viewing his entire body of work as a complete whole, or that, you know, the idea that he, when he started writing things like 10, 15 years before Capital, that he already had all of his ideas formulated, his theory of value was fully thought up. I think that's a bit mistaken. Certain Marxists describe Capital as an unfinished research project. And I think that we should look at it through that lens where a lot of these ideas were developing in thought and presentation, and he was continuously refining them rather than it ever being like a finished whole that he just never wrote the fourth volume to in the case of Capital. And I think that this is kind of just made worse, I guess, by how some of the volumes of Capital emerged. So like volume two and three were actually put together by Engels after Marx's death, right? And in doing this, he ended up using manuscripts as we can see in the table, that are dated much earlier than Marx's last editions of volume one. And, you know, I'm, I'm not highlighting this to like disparage angles or anything, because I do think that he had a very difficult task in executing Marx's literary estate. But I do think it's important to consider 
when we encounter things like ambiguities between volumes or between theories that are given by Marx, especially with Marx's theory of value in the third volume. I think that you know the differences in dates that happen here also reflect a difference in Marx's research and in the levels of ab abstraction that he was working with at the time. So what does the subtitle mean, right? The subtitle of Capital is a critique of political economy. <clears throat> and I think I've said that a couple of times. I've said a critique, but what does that really mean, right? I think often the traditional, traditional way capital is thought of is as the basis of a Marxist political economy, which is opposed to bourgeois political economy, right? And the idea that Marx had taken the labor theory of value from Smith and Ricardo, who were two of the biggest representatives of bourgeois political economy, and he had developed on top of it, right? Unlike them, he was able to develop the concept of surplus value. He was able to identify uh, the exploitation that was behind the evils of capitalism. But I think that both of these ideas are a bit mistaken about what Marx was trying to do and what he was able to do with capital. And that's reflected in the subtitle of the work, right? Because by critique of political economy, Marx didn't want to provide an alternative political economy. He wanted to criticize the entirety of it, of political economy as a branch of knowledge. He wanted to criticize the categorical presuppositions. So he wanted to not just criticize the conclusions that it came to taking the same starting points, but he wanted to criticize those starting points in the first place. Things that it finds so self-evident that it, they don't need to be explained at all. You know, like Adam Smith's famous quote of humanities uh, propensity to truck, barter, and exchange. And one of the things that I'm hoping to do with this presentation is help us understand not only what Marx is saying in the chapter, but also how he exposits this critique and how it rises to the level of critique. And then last part of the intro, uh, theories of value. We are going to spend a lot of time talking about the word value, theories of value in general. So I think that before we do that, it would be good to talk a little bit about theories of value in classical political economy, um, just because the field in general was much different uh, in Marx's time compared to modern economics. And considering this is what he was critiquing when he was building his theory of value or his uh, critique of political economy, then this is what we should learn about. So for this, I think a good example is to look at Ricardo who was Marx's favorite bourgeois political economist, and also Adam Smith, right? Smith and Ricardo are, are often lumped into the category of classical political economists. And one thing I think is extremely important to note when talking about theories of value is that as opposed to the modern marginal utility of value or the subjective theory of value that emerged with marginal revolution and economics in the 1900s, the classical political, classical political economists, so Smith and Ricardo, and also Marx, were not concerned when developing their theories of value with developing a rigorous theory of price determination. <clears throat> so, and, and that's a very important point. So I wanna make that clear again. Ricardo, Smith, Marx were not concerned with developing theories of price determination. For the classical political economists, the determination of prices was always a subordinate concern. It was never primary for for Smith, for Ricardo, their starting point was always the social classes of society, the relations between them, and as Simon Clark says in Marx, Marginalism and Modern Sociology, the constitutional order within which capitalism could best develop to the advantage of the nation as a whole. And then Clark also goes on to say, the rigorous determination of individual prices was of little concern, so long as the determination of prices could be assumed not to conflict too seriously with the theory of distribution. Okay, so a couple of things there, right? Yes, just like Marx, right? The classical political economists took the social classes of society as their starting point, right? And that's something that we often don't see after the marginal revolution in like modern economics, like Friedman, et cetera. And, you know, Ricardo lays this out very clearly in his book, The Principles of Political Economy and Taxation. He says that his goal is to uncover the laws that regulate the distribution of the produce of the earth 
all that is derived from its service by the united application of labor, machinery, and capital. Among the three classes of the community, namely the proprietor of the land, the owner of the stock or capital necessary for its cultivation, and the laborers by whose industry it is cultivated. So it's clear there that Ricardo's not primarily concerned with figuring out the price of individual commodities, right? He wants to determine the laws that regulate distribution in the hopes of understanding relations between classes so that the economy can be provided growth. So now how does he do this, right? How does he go on to do it? He uses the labor theory of value. And we're gonna talk about the labor theory of value as opposed to Marx's theory of value later. But again, what I want to be clear, clear about is that Smith, Ricardo, Marx were not concerned with questions of rigorous price determination. It was never the first thing that they cared about. There was always something else. And for Smith and Ricardo, that was the theory of distribution. To view any of these economists, to view Smith, Ricardo, Marx through the lens of marginalism, through the lens of modern economics where you know the rational individual making choices about price is the is the goal i think is a big mistake and shouldn't be used here uh cool that was all i had for the introduction part i guess are there any questions so far no cool all right <clears throat> section one so marx starts out with the section entitled the two factors of commodity use value and value and this is exactly what we're going to be examining right these two factors of the commodity so use value is the first one that we're going to start with and use value use value is relatively simple he says a commodity such as iron corn or a diamond is therefore so far as it as it is a material thing a use value something useful so it's the physical manifestation of the commodity and the utility of it, okay? So for a chair, it's that you can sit on it, you can stand on it, it's comfortable, okay? For a book, yeah, you can read it, it's made of paper, it burns well, stuff like that. He continues, use values become a reality only by use or consumption. They also constitute the substance of all wealth, whatever may be the social form of that wealth, in the form of society that we're about to consider, they are in addition, the material depositories of exchange value. So here he starts talking about, and he starts to distinguish between form and content, okay? He says that use values constitute the substance of all wealth, whatever may be the social form of that wealth. So if we think about like a feudal society, right? The social form of the wealth would be a tithe or a tribute that the peasant pays to the Lord. Okay, and the content would still be the use value. Maybe it's like a sack of wheat or something. Okay, in capitalism, that sack of wheat would still be a use value. The only difference now is that it has taken on a different social form, and that social form is now the commodity. And we're gonna come. We're gonna keep coming back to form and content here. So. Yeah, he stated that use values are the material depositories of exchange value, right? But what is exchange value? He says that at first sight, it's a quantitative rel it's a quantitative relation. So it's the proportion in which use values in it's the proportion in which values in use of one sort are exchanged for those of another sort. So keep it really simple. One chair is exchanged for two pairs of pants. So the exchange value of that one chair is two pairs of pants. It's a quantitative relation here. So now for one commodity, we're going to stick with one chair, just because it's easy, can be exchanged for two pants, just like we said, but it can also be exchanged for like three shirts and maybe two bars of gold as well, right? So Marx says it can be exchanged for other commodities in the most different proportions. So a commodity doesn't just have one exchange value, right? Because it can be exchanged for all of these different other commodities. So it has many exchange values representing all of these different exchanges when we look at it at the level of this simple commodity exchange. But there's, there's something implied here, right? Like if we can exchange one chair for two pants 
and three shirts and two bars of gold, then the three shirts, the two pants, the two bars of gold, those should all be equal to each other in some way if they're all able to be equated to that one chair. So how are they equal in this way? Well, Marx says, therefore, first, the valid exchange values of a given commodity express something equal. Secondly, exchange value, generally, is only the mode of expression, the phenomenal form of something contained in it, yet distinguishable from it. So per Marx, right, exchange value is only the mode of expression of something else. It's only the form, not the content of something distinguishable from it. So exchange value, one chair for two pairs of pants, is, is just expressing the equality of something else, some third property that these two commodities must be reducible to. And we're going to try and find out what that is. <clears throat> so uh, Marx keeps going down this line and keeps coming up with equations of equating commodities, right? He starts equating like corn and iron saying that for one quarter of corn, it must be equal to some X pounds of iron. And then from this equation, something must allow their equality. Okay. Just like we've been saying, there must be something common in them both. He says each of them so far as exchange value must therefore be reducible to this third. So we're looking at it only as exchange value, right? Which means because there are two factors of a commodity, use value and value, we're abstracting from use value. We're only thinking about exchange. But what is this, this third thing that both can be reduced to? Okay, is it a physical aspect? Is it their shape, a chemical component, uh, some natural property like color? And Marx says, no, right? It, it can't be any of, any of those things. It can't be the color, it can't be the size because all of those only affect the utility of the commodity. Their usefulness or their physical attributes, those only affect the part of the commodity that is the use value, right? It's physical manifestation. And Marx says that, you know, the exchange of commodities is characterized by total abstraction from use value. And this is true because in exchange, any commodity can be just as good as any other, as long as you have enough, enough of them. Like sure, one piece of paper is pretty cheap, right? But if you get enough pieces of paper and you can exchange for a bar of gold. So Marx says as use values, commodities are above all of different qualities, but as exchange values, they're merely different quantities and consequently, do not contain an atom of use value. So we're abstracting completely from their aspect as use values. And where does that leave us? It leaves us with the fact that they're products of labor. Cool, any, any questions so far on use value and value before we get into uh, labor? Okay, cool. So yes, Marx says that they're reducible to labor, but he doesn't really just mean labor, I guess. He, he goes on to say, if we make abstraction from its use value, we make abstraction at the same time from the material elements and shapes that make the product a use value. We see in it no longer a table, house, yarn, or any other useful thing. Its existence as a material thing is put out of sight. Neither can it any longer be regarded as the product of the labor of the joiner, the mason, the spinner, or any other definite kind of productive labor. Along with the useful qualities of the products themselves, we put out of sight both the useful character of the various kinds of labor embodied in them and the concrete forms of that labor. There is nothing left but what is common to them all. All are reduced to one and the same sort of labor, human labor in the abstract. Right. So again, we, we abstracted from use value in order to, to figure out that this third common property is labor, but in abstracting from use value, right, we're, we're abstracting from the physical manifestation of the commodity. So we're not thinking about a chair as a chair, and we're not thinking about the labor that went into the chair as carbon carpentry, right? We're not thinking about, um, if it's like a, a shirt, we're not thinking about like the weaving anymore. We're not thinking about 
the, the concrete labor that went into it. Mark says we're thinking about human labor in the abstract. So Marx then says that as, as objectifications of this social substance common to them all, aka abstract human labor, these commodities are values as opposed to in their useful physical form, their use values. So he goes on to say, the progress of our investigation will show that exchange value is the only form in which the values of commodities can manifest itself or be expressed. For the present, however, we have to consider the nature of value independently of this, its form. So what does that mean? He, he emphasizes here, right? Use value is the physical manifestation, usefulness, but exchange value, one chair exchanges for uh, a bar of gold or two shirts, is only the form of appearance of value. And it's as a result of being the products of abstract human labor that these commodities are values. And he also specifically says that exchange value is the only form in which the values of commodities can be manifest, can manifest itself. So we can't express value in terms of the amount of labor, like by some abstract labor unit, right? He's saying very, very clearly here that exchange value is the only form in which this value can be man can manifest itself. And what makes up this value is human labor in the abstract. And that's going to be the idea that exchange value is the only form of appearance is also going to be very important when we get to section four. Cool. And if, if anyone has any questions, feel free to just stop me rather than like waiting for the end. It's totally fine. So continuing on with section one. Uh, a use value has value, right? Only because human labor in the abstract has been embodied in it. Marx says, but Marx asks, how do we measure this, right? How is the magnitude of this value to be measured? And he says, it's by the, the, the labor contained in the article, right? The amount of time spent to produce it, basically. He says, the quantity of labor, however, is measured by its duration and labor time in turn finds its standards in weeks, days, and hours. So again, this isn't to say like, this commodity is worth four hours of labor, right? Because yes, labor time is the content of value, but the form of appearance of value is exchange value. So he then gets into like the counter example of, oh, I spent five hours making this pen and someone else spent two hours making a pen. Does that mean my pen is more valuable? And he says, no, right? Because it's not the amount of time that you spent making the commodity, but it's rather the amount of labor socially necessary or the labor time socially necessary for its production. And he describes what that means. He says, socially necessary labor time is the labor time required to produce any use value under the conditions of production for a given society and with the average degree of skill and intensity of labor prevalent in that society. So if a society is able to, on average, produce a chair in five hours, I shouldn't expect to like spend 10 hours, then my chair is worth more money. The value is determined socially, not individually by the labor time that I expect. So then Marx ends the section with a paragraph kind of like qualifying his theory of value a bit. He, he talks about how a thing can be a, can be a use value without having value. So things like air, uh, virgin soil, natural meadows, other utilities that don't arise from human, la from human labor. And because they don't arise from human labor, right, they're not commodities. So even though they're used to values, they don't have any value. And then he also makes an important note that whoever directly satisfies his wants with the produce of his own labor creates indeed use values, but not commodities. In order to produce the latter, he must not only produce use values, but use values for others, social use values. So just expending labor to create commodities that no one wants does not create value, okay? Those are not social use values. And this is part of the socially necessary part of socially necessary labor time. And similarly, right, if I just like make myself a pizza and then I eat it, 
I'm also not exchanging that. So that also would not be, there, there also wouldn't be any value there, right? I'm just creating a use value for myself. And that's section one, right? That's, that's one fourth of the chapter done. Um, does anyone have any questions about use value or value, comments? No? Okay, cool. So now we're going to get on to section two. So section two is on the twofold character of the labor embodied in commodities. Okay. So the previous section, right, was on the commodity is having two factors. It had a use value and it had a value, which the form of appearance was its, its exchange value. But now we're going to see that, you know, just like the commodity, the labor also has a twofold character. And this twofold character is the concrete useful labor versus the abstract labor, which we've talked about a little bit. So for the former, for concrete useful labor, Marx gives the examples of a coat and linen. And I think this is like the famous example where everyone's just like, oh, Marx just spends 50 pages talking about how many coats are worth, uh, or how many linen is worth one coat or whatever. And he does, he does talk about this while, but he says that both are commodities and both are created via, via two entirely separate concrete labors, one being tailoring and the other being weaving. So therefore, from this, we can tell that in all of the different kinds of commodities, there are different kinds of useful labor in their production. So it's different people performing different jobs where they perform different forms of concrete labor. Okay? So this is useful concrete labor exercised with a definite aim, and this is what creates the use value. Okay, and this is not specific to capitalism, right? Marx, Marx goes at lengths to describe so far, therefore, as labor is creator of use value, is useful labor, it is a necessary condition, independent of all forms of society, for the existence of the human race. It is an eternal nature-imposed necessity, without which there can be no material exchanges between man and nature, and therefore no life. So that's useful concrete labor, right? Rather simple. It creates use values, concrete things. Now we're going to look at abstract labor, which is the creator of value and exchange value. So Marx says productive activity, if we leave out of sight its special form, the useful character of labor, is nothing but the expenditure of human labor power, tailoring and weaving, though qualitatively different productive activities are each a productive expenditure of human brains, nerves, and muscles. And in this sense, they're human labor. They are but two different modes of expending human labor power. So on some level, both tailoring and weaving are human labor, right? It's just some person doing some productive activity. If we abstract away from the specific act and also from the intensity or the skill that that act might require into just simple, average labor that anyone can possess, then that's, we, then, then we can reduce it to abstract labor. And by this, Marx says, skilled labor only counts as simple labor intensified, or rather as multiplied simple labor, a given quality, a given quantity of skilled being considered equal to a greater quantity of simple labor. And this reduction is exactly what allows the equation of commodities. Right, so experience shows that this reduction is constantly being made. A commodity may be the product of the most skilled labor, but its value by equating it to the product of simple unskilled labor represents a definite quantity of the latter labor alone. So is this reduction of skilled to average labor something consciously done by the producers? And no, Marx says that you know, the different proportions in which different sorts of labor are reduced to the unskilled labor as their standard are established by a social, a social process that goes on behind the backs of the producers and consequently appears to be fixed by custom. And then Marx says that for ease in the rest of the book, in the rest of the chapter, we're going to talk about unskilled, simple labor. So what does that all mean? Um, abstract labor, right? We're abstracting away from the the concrete labor being performed, the actual form of productive activity. 
to just human labor power being, being expended, where skilled labor gets reduced to simple, average, unskilled labor, but of a higher quantity. Okay. And then he also makes it clear that this is not something that is consciously done by producers in exchange. It's something that's fixed by social custom, where certain forms of labor in society uh, are seen as a higher quantity of simple average labor. Okay. So if we go back to the coat and linen, his favorite example, when we view them as values by equating them as exchange values, right, we're abstracting from their use values. We disregard the differences between weaving and tailoring. He says that as use values, coat and linen are, on the other hand, mere homogenous congelations of undifferentiated labor. So the labor embodied in these latter values does not count by virtue of, of its production, productive relation to cloth and yarn, but only as being expenditure of human labor power. So now this, this whole thing might seem like a very minute technical argument. Right, it kind of seems like, oh yes, so we count them both as labor. Bam, it's it's abstract labor, and then you know if it's more skilled, then it's just a bigger number. But it's it's important to note the implications behind what Marx is saying. So he says that abstract human labor is what constitutes value, right? Not the concrete labor. So there's an important question of can we measure this abstract labor time in production? Or are we just measuring the time of the concrete labor performed to create the particular use value? And this is an important point, right? Because how can we, can we measure value in production if we can't measure the abstract labor? Or can we measure the abstract labor? So I'm going to talk about it more in section four when I try to bring the whole chapter together. But it would also be good to keep in mind when we get to section three, we talk about the forms of exchange and exchange value. And then I'm also going to return to how the abstraction occurs a bit more, how concrete labor is abstracted into abstract labor. But I think for now, it's good enough we just understand that concrete labor creates use values, abstract labor creates value. Uh, and I think, yeah, that's section two. Does anyone have any questions, comments on labor? Okay, cool. So the next, <clears throat> next section is different, I would say. Um, section one and two, right? We talked about use value. We, we talked about exchange value a little bit. We talked about value. We talked about labor. But in section three, his argument starts to change a little bit. It gets different. He starts to talk about exchange value again. In, in section one, like he mentions exchange value, right? But he notes that he's going to put it aside for now and he's going to talk about value, which is, which, you know, exchange value is just the appearance of value, the form of appearance of value. In this section, he's going to try and show how it happens that the value of a commodity is not expressed directly, right? It's not expressed. It's not expressed by its socially necessary labor time. It's only expressed in the form of exchange value. And then he's gonna, he's gonna analyze exchange value as the value form of the commodity, where use, use value is the natural form and exchange value is its social form. So again, just like how we talked about the tithe being the social form of the use value under feudalism. So at the beginning of this section, Marx has what I think is some very good lines on value, where he says, the value of commodities is the very opposite of the coarse materiality of their substance. Not an atom of matter enters into its composition. Turn and examine a single commodity by itself as we will. Yet insofar as it remains an object of value, it seems impossible to grasp it. If, however, we bear in mind that the value of commodities has a purely social reality and that they acquire this reality only insofar as they are expressions, or embodiments of one identical social substance, aka human labor, it follows as a matter of course that value can only manifest itself in the social relation of commodity 
to commodity. So he calls this phenomenon later as the, the spectral objectivity of value. And it, but again, the emphasis here is that value is a social relation concerning the social substance of labor and that value is not something we could find among the commodity's physical attributes. So the task he lays out in this, in this investigation that we're about to take a look at is tracing the genesis of this money form of developing the expression of value implied in the value relation of commodities from its simplest, almost imperceptible outline to the dazzling money form. Because the money form is, as Marx is going to try and show, a result of exchange and of exchange value. Okay, so there's going to be some equations here, unfortunately. <laughs> um, we, we start with what Marx calls the simplest value relation. Um, it's like a, a subsection titled elementary or accidental form of value. And basically, like coming back to the linen and the coat, right? 20 yards of linen is equal to one coat, or X of commodity A is equal to Y of commodity B. Okay, so Marx tells us that in this equation, the two commodities are playing two different parts. The linen, who is in the beginning of this equation, is expressing its value in the coat. And the coat is serving as the material in which that value is expressed. So the value of the linen is represented as what Marx calls relative value. Or in other words, the linen is appearing in relative form, while the coat appears in equivalent form. What does that mean? Well, the linen is in relative form because its value is expressed in relation to something else. And the coat appears in the equivalent form because it's serving as the equivalent for the value of the first commodity. So what is the, the value of 20 yards of linen? Well, it, it is the coat. The coat is serving as the equivalent for that value. So in this, in this simple expression of value, right, only the value of the linen is being expressed. We're saying the value of the linen, of 20 yards of linen, is one coat. The linen, the linen is worth one coat, okay? But the equation also implies the reverse. We can just flip it around, right? Reverse around the equal sign. One coat is equal to 20 yards of linen. When we put it this way, the coat is in the relative form while the linen is in the equivalent form. So this equation also, also shows us that we can't grasp value only with an individual use value, right? You can't just do it with a coat. One coat is equal to one coat. doesn't make any sense, okay? We need both commodities to truly express value. Michael Heinrich writes, it only obtains a tangible form in the expression of value. The commodity that appears as the equivalent form, commodity B, now has the status of being the embodiment of value of the commodity in the relative form of value, commodity A. But if you look at it in isolation, the second commodity is just as much a use value as the first commodity. It's within this expression of value that the second commodity in the equivalent form plays a specific role. It has the status not of being a particular use value anymore. It also counts simultaneously in its manifestation as use value as a direct embodiment of value. So the value of linen only acquires an objective form. The value of linen is only capable of any expression because the value of that linen is assuming the form of the coat, right? When that happens, the value of linen becomes tangible, it becomes visible, it's measurable, you can hold it, it's now a real thing. On this, Marx writes, human labor power in motion, or human labor, creates value, but is not itself the value. It becomes value only in its congealed state when embodied in the form of some object. In order to express the value of the linen as a congelation of human labor, that value must be expressed as having objective existence, as being a something materially different from the linen itself. And this is this directly relates to what we said earlier on the only possible expression of value being exchange value, right? The only way to express the value inherent in commodity A is to relate it to some commodity B, as they both contain the same amounts of abstract human labor measured by its socially necessary labor time.
So the next, the next step, step in his value form analysis is the total or expanded form of value. Right, so before we were looking at the elementary form or accidental form, and that helped us relate commodity A to commodity B. Okay, but what if I want to look at commodity A to literally every other commodity in the world, right? The entire world of commodities. And this is how Marx brings us to the total form or the expanded form, right? So it's 20 yards of linen, which was our commodity A, to one coat, which is commodity B, but also to 10 pounds of tea, 40 pounds of coffee, and then every other commodity on earth, right? Just an endless list. So when we do this, when we have this, this equation, then the value of linen is now, it's, it's truly expressed and it stands in relation to the entire world of commodities. And it's also very clear that with this equation, the value of the commodity is indifferent towards the particular use value that is expressed. So it doesn't matter what use value the value of the linen is being expressed in, it could be anything as long as it's a big enough quantity, right? Like it doesn't care if it's a coat or tea as long as it's the right amount. But what is this form really, right? It's just an endless chain of expressions of the value of commodity A, right? It's without closure, it's, mutual, it's mutually exclusive, it's better than the simple form, right? Because now it's not just uh, it's not just us equating linen and coat, but it's only better because it's just a bunch of series of simple forms, right? But something else happens with this expanded form of value. If if this was taking place, right? If I'm exchanging my linen for someone's coat and then someone else's tea and then someone else's coffee, right? Then conversely, all of those people, they exchanged their commodities for my linen, right? So I've, I expressed my, I expressed the value of my linen in person A, A's coat, person B's tea, person C's coffee, but person A, B, and C expressed the values of their commodity in linen. They all expressed the value of their various commodities in the same commodity, my linen. So what we can do is we can reverse this expanded form of value to give us the general form of value. And this general form is exactly the reverse, right? It's all the commodities on earth being expressed in a single commodity. So now all the commodities are expressing their value in an elementary form because they're doing it in one commodity but they're also doing it with unity since they're all doing it in the same commodity. They're all doing it in my linen. Marx says, this form expresses the values of the whole world of commodities in terms of a single commodity set apart for the purpose, namely the linen, and thus represents to us their values by means of their equality with the linen. The value of every commodity is now by being equated to linen, not only differentiated from its own use value, but from all other use values generally and is, by that very fact, expressed as that which is common to all commodities. By this form, commodities are, for the first time, effectively brought into relation with one another as values, or made to appear as exchange values." So that last part is a very, it raises a very important question in my opinion. He says that this is the first time that commodities are made effectively to appear as exchange values. So why is it that only in the general form of value that this happens? Why is this only the first time? And it's because it's, it's the first time in this form, it's the first time that all these different kinds of private labor through the commodities produced by it, they acquire in consequence, a social character, the character of equality with all other kinds of labor when they're equated to this general equivalent. All other commodities are related to this general equivalent. So relating my, my commodity to this general equivalent is a relation of my commodity to the whole world of commodities. If everyone is relating their commodity to linen, and then I relate my chair to linen, then I'm relating my commodity to the entire world of commodities. Marx says, a commodity only acquires a general expression of its value if at the same time, all the other commodities express their values in the same equivalent. 
and every newly emergent commodity must follow suit. It thus becomes evident that because the objectivity of commodities as values is the purely social existence of these things, it can only be expressed through the whole range of their social relations. The general value form is the reduction of all kinds of actual labor to their common character of being human labor generally, of being the expenditure of human labor power. So the social character of value, which Marx has repeatedly been preaching about by saying it over and over, emphasizing the social character of labor, achieves, achieves its best expression so far in a specifically social form of value through this general equivalent. And then from this general equivalent, we get to the money form. And the money form is basically when a particular commodity that is the general equivalent, it, it becomes the money commodity, basically. It, it ends up serving, serving as money. Marx says that it becomes the special social function of that commodity. And consequence, consequently, it's social monopoly to play within the world of commodities, the part of universal equivalent. There, there isn't much of a change in the role between general equivalent and money form. The only difference is that from the general equivalent, social custom has, has made that commodity the money commodity, basically. And Marx talks about this specifically with gold, but I don't think that it necessarily holds itself to only being a commodity in the form of gold. Like obviously now we don't peg the US dollar or peg modern currency to gold, but I think it still holds. And there are a lot of uh, great books on that, but th that is outside of the scope of this talk. Um, Marx goes on. Uh, yeah, Cameron, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I, uh, um, give me a second. Um, yeah, so I, I guess what uh, does he mention in this chapter, or does he go into it like in depth? Because this could definitely be a thing that uh, need requires a whole chapter. But um, does Marx ever engage with like the idea of fiat currency, or would he say that all all currencies are backed by this implied labor power? Um, I don't believe he deals with fiat currency at length. Um, I mean, I, I definitely think that his theory of money, it gets, it gets talked about more, I think, in chapter three, definitely. This is more of just the money form of exchange value. Um, I, I definitely think it still holds, even in a world where, you know, modern currency isn't backed by a specific commodity. Um, Yeah, I mean, in general, like it's just obviously at the time Marx was writing, it, it, the concept of money not being backed by a commodity wasn't really around. It wasn't really a thing. So it wasn't something that he dealt with. Uh, I can definitely give you a recommendation to read more about it if you want. There's a great book called Marx on Money by, um, I think this like French, French communist from the 70s that talks about it a bit more. Yeah, that um, I will have to take a look at that because yeah, that, that just seems like um, I mean I don't know uh, how how useful that would be in in terms of uh, kind of convincing people of the uh, economic like Marx's economic theory, but that seems like um, if Marx could you know somewhere in there have a uh, an explanation for fiat currency or you know there are some people who are obsessed with the gold standard and think we should go back to that. Um, it seems like there, there could be a lot of uh, explanatory power, like for explaining to the masses how, um, yeah, I guess how money functions. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I'd love to, to look further into that. Yeah. And I personally, I think, and hopefully maybe section four is going to make it a bit more clear that the concept of like a non-commodity backed money doesn't really affect Marx's theory of value too much based on what I'm going to talk about in section four. Um, I mean, he does deal with stuff like 
quantity theory of theories of money in uh, I think like chapter three of Capital. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely um, send you that that book that I was talking about. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for uh, thanks for the answer. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yes, via social custom, right? The general equivalent starts to serve as the money, the money commodity, which has historically been gold. Um, Marx then finishes up by pointing out that the elementary expression of the relative value of a single commodity, right? So how we did 20 yards of linen is equal to one quote, one coat, but in terms of the money commodity, so 20 yards of linen is worth some amount of gold, right? That's the price form of the commodity. So that would be the price form of linen. And that right there is Marx's analysis of the forms of value and of exchange value. So in it, Marx started out with the simplest possible sort of exchange relation, right? Uh, 20 yards of linen to one coat. And then he introduced successively more sophisticated forms until eventually he reached the money form. Why did he do this, right? He said that he wanted to uncover the mystery of money or why everything can be bought for money rather than just exchanged for another commodity to get beyond just the purely quantitative exchange relation and to understand the really social content of that relation or to show that the relation between values is the basis of all forms of exchange, whether it's the simplest to the most developed. And just to be clear, right? Like as we went through this analysis and went from simplest to most developed, this is all in terms of analytical level, right? This is not a, and Marx is not at any point in this giving a historical view of exchange. He's not giving a history of the emergence of money. This is all at the analytical level of abstraction. And from this, we see that commodity exchange give, gives rise to money and not the inverse the idea that money gives rise to exchange, that doesn't happen. And that in all forms of exchange, the backing force is the relationship between values. Okay, section four. <clears throat> so this section is called the fetishism of commodities and the secret thereof. In my opinion, this is the most important in, in all of the first chapter, maybe all of the book, I don't know. In the first three chapters that we just discussed, right? Ignoring my intro in just these first three, three er, sections, sorry. In these first three sections that we just discussed, I think it's very easy to see Marx as offering a technical economic argument that more or less serves as an expansion on the ideas of Ricardo, right? With a few technical, technological alterations, such as the introduction of the concepts of abstract labor and socially necessary labor time, okay? When we read Capital from that view, Marx ends up more or less agreeing with Ricardo's labor theory of value. He the, the idea that the relation presented in value is a relation between the individual producer's labor and the commodity, where, you know, at the time of production, the producer's labor is abstracted, it gets reduced to a social average to include Marx's SNLT in there, and now it resides in the commodity. And when read in this way, I think it also follows the idea that we can determine value in production if we know the average times of production for a commodity before exchange has even entered the, the equation. So like if I'm making pencils, then I can find out what the average production time of pencils is across society. And that's gonna be the socially necessary labor time. That's gonna be the magnitude of value. When we read capital in this way, Marx's only, only real contribution, his only real extension of Ricardo's theory of surplus value, which we didn't discuss it because it comes at a, a bit later chapter. I think it's like maybe the second or third chapter or something. But his only extension of Ricardo's theory would be the introduction of surplus value, which usually in this reading, this Ricardian reading, it's the idea that 
surplus value is something that's stolen from the workers by the capitalists. The, this interpretation of the first chapter, where the relation is between the individual producer and the commodity that they created, also seems to imply that Marx's theory of value is something generally interested in the prices of commodities. And what determines those prices is going to be the socially necessary labor time that goes into them. And then that theory of price, which it seems like Marx is giving, just feeds back into the idea that his biggest, his biggest new notion that he's offering is that of surplus value, where you know surplus value ends up being the big injustice of capitalism that Marx was able to articulate that Ricardo could not. But one thing I really tried to make clear in the introduction is that Marx was not concerned with providing a theory of price. He did not care about the rigorous determination of price. So if that's the case, right, he doesn't care about giving a theory of price, but we just read the first three sections and it kind of seems like he was telling us how to determine the price of a commodity based on the amount of labor that went into it. Then what's that about? How does that, how, how, how does that affect how we should read the first three sections, right? And I think that the fourth section kind of gives the key to that. Um, I think reading the fourth section as the basis of the entire chapter, such as readings popularized by I.I. I. Rubin in his essays on Marx's theory of value, or Simon Clark, Michael Heinrich, et cetera, give us the answer to this. And they help us understand the issues in that Ricardian reading of capital that I just mentioned. So let's look at section four. Marx starts by noting that in his analysis, we notice that a commodity is a very strange thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties, with this mythical, mystical character coming directly from its form as a commodity. He says, the equality of all sorts of human labor is expressed objectively by their products all being equally values. The measure of the, of the expenditure of labor power by the duration of that expenditure takes the form of the quantity of value of the products of labor. And finally, the mutual relations of the producers within which the social character of the labor affirms themselves takes the form of a social relation between products. So a commodity is a strange thing, right? Because in it, the social character of labor appears to the producers as an objective character stamped onto the product of their labor. Value appears to be inherent into the commodity, a semi-natural property. You know, this chair has, this chair is made of wood, it has a color, it's sturdy, it has a price. Price seems to be an inherent quality. But Marx also goes to a bit of a length to say that this just this isn't just a sense of false consciousness. This isn't the the people that see prices as an inherent quality, they're not just confused. This isn't just a veil that needs to be lifted off their heads. Marx says, the social relations between their private labors appears as what they are. They do not appear as direct social relations between persons in their work, but rather as material relations between persons and social relations between things. So yes, this fetishism, this thinking that commodities have price as an inherent quality, it occurs as a result of the fact that under commodity production, people don't relate to each other directly in a social way. Instead, they relate to each other through commodities. But this isn't just false consciousness. This isn't just a veil. It's a necessity imposed upon them by capitalism. It's a system in which things take on social characteristics. Things take on things like value. So how does this how does this happen? I guess is the question then. And Marx then reiterates a bit of the analysis that we went through to find out where this fetishism had its origin. But it's it's in doing this this reiteration a bit that I think it, he finally makes it clear how his theory of value transcends Ricardo's and is able to go to the level of critique rather than providing a new Marxist political economy. So he says that use values only become commodities because they're the products of private individuals who carry on their work independently of each other. This isn't anything new, right? They carry on their work privately. 
they come to the market, they exchange their commodities. Marx then starts talking about value and he doesn't talk about it like he did before a little bit, I guess. He, he doesn't talk about it as a relation of labor embodied in the commodity. Instead, he says, the sum total of the labor of all of these private individuals forms the aggregate labor of society. Since the producers do not come into social contact with each other until they exchange their products, the specific social character of each producer's labor does not show itself except in the act of exchange. In other words, the labor of the individual asserts itself as part of the labor of society only by means of the relations which the act of exchange establishes directly between the products and indirectly through them between the producers. To the latter, therefore, the relations connecting the labor of one individual with that of the rest appear not as direct social relations between individuals at work, but as what they really are, material relations between persons and social relations between things. And here, in, the, in the, the first quote that I have on this slide is where I think for the very first time, Marx makes it extremely clear what he means when he talks about social labor and what he's trying to do with his theory of value. Value doesn't express the labor time actually embodied in the commodity. Value is not, in Ricardo's world, it would be the labor I individually put into the commodity. That's not what it is. And on the same, same note, right, in that Ricardian reading of capital, it's not the labor socially expended into the commodity. So it's not the average amount of time for the labor to be done embodied in the commodity. Instead, Marx is saying that value is a social relation of the labor time of the individual producer in relation to the labor time of society as a whole. Marx says, right, in this quote, the labor of the individual asserts itself as part of the labor of society. And this only happens through exchange. To understand, to understand that a little bit better, later on in the chapter, Marx says his theory differs from previous ones, like Ricardo, because he examines closely the form of value. What does that mean? Simon Clark can help us here. He says that understanding the exchange of commodities, not simply in terms of technical, economic relations that take exchange itself as a social phenomenon for granted, but rather as one means by which the social division of labor can be regulated. So Marx isn't interested in these exchange relations in order to develop a theory of price. We didn't, th those first three, sec three sections, right? Marx was not trying to tell us that the socially average amount of time to produce a commodity is its price. He's not interested in proving that the price of commodity X is four hours of labor because that's the average amount of time it takes our society. Instead, he wants to show that these exchange relations are the particular social form in which the labors of individual producers who work entirely independent from one another are brought into relation with each other and with the needs of society. For Marx, this exchange relations are a form of the social relations of production. The market regulates the interdependence of the producers who appear to be working totally independently of, of each other. And therefore, it also regulates the social division of labor. So again, the idea that exchange relations reflect labor time, it was not original, right? Marx did not take this from Ricardo only to add the idea of, oh, it's not just your labor, it's the social average labor, right? Instead, he wanted to show how exchange is a system of social relationships that regulate the social division of labor under capitalism. And so his theory of value is explicitly concerned with how the individual labor, the private producer, becomes part of the sum of the total social labor. So how does the private producer Take my, how, how do I, as someone working by myself, I don't know what anyone else in society needs, but I've created a commodity. 
I put some labor in order to create that commodity, right? I, I expended some of my labor. How do I now assert the labor that I expended as part of the total labor of society? How do I validate my labor as part as a necessary part of the of society's social division of labor? And that is what Marx is trying to do with his theory of value. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, so if we then go back to some of the stuff that I kind of glossed over in the first three sections, um, I talked about, can we measure abstract labor, right? Or can we measure socially necessary labor time that occurred like, can we measure socially necessary labor time during production? And from this new understanding of Marx's theory of value, the answer is no, we can't, right? Because what we measure in production is the concrete labor. The only way to measure socially necessary labor time, the only way to find out socially necessary labor time is to bring my product to market, because that's the only way that I can assert my labor as part of the total social labor. It's in exchange that this, this reduction of concrete labor to abstract labor actually happens. And it's not in the English, uh, I think like when you buy Penguin, you get like the English translation of the German third edition. It's not in there, but in the French edition of Capital, which was actually the last edition revised by Marx before his death, he includes this quote that is at the top of the screen. It's the reduction of various concrete private acts of labor to this abstraction of equal human labor is only carried out through exchange, which in fact equates products of different acts of labor with each other. So the abstraction that takes place here, it's not a mental one, right? The abstraction of concrete labor to abstract labor doesn't take place in the mind. It's a real abstraction that occurs when we take, we take a commodity to market and we submit it to a test of social validation we see if the labor I expended on it, my concrete labor is gonna be validated as part of the sum of total, total social labor. We find out in exchange if my labor was socially necessary, if I expended too much labor time, not enough labor time. In capitalism, there's no conscious planning of production. So it's in exchange, it's in bringing it to the market that that the labor of society is regulated. And then in section four, just again, to make it even more concrete, make it more clear, Marx again rebuts the idea that his theory is a theory of the determination of prices by labor time. He explicitly says, hence, when we bring the products of our labor into relation with each other as values, it is not because we see in these articles the material receptacles of homogeneous human labor. We are not aware of this. Nevertheless, we do it. So then if we take this, this meaning of value, right, as a social relation between the labor of the individual producers and then the sum total labor of society, this also has a big influence on the meaning of fetishism of a commodity. So in a society where things have social characteristics, Marx says, you know, here in Capital and also in some of his early works, that this ends up meaning that the commodities have power over their producers. You know, I want my I want my commodity to be validated as, or I want the labor expended in my commodity to be validated as part of the sum of the total social labor of society, so that I can survive. Right? I want my labor to prove to be socially necessary, but I don't know if this is going to happen until I bring it to market and I exchange it. Marx says, the character of having value when once impressed upon products obtains fixity only by reason of their acting and reacting upon each other as quantities of value. These quantities vary continually, independently of their will, foresight, and action of the producers. To them, their own social action takes the form of the action of objects, which rule the producers instead of being ruled by them. My only hope then, right, to validate my individual labor that I spent on this commodity is either to produce in certain ways that I think are more likely to help me exchange or to spend as little time as possible on it in the hopes that 
if my labor is not socially validated, not too much is lost. So this, this impersonal domination, right, where under feudalism, you were directly dominated by your lord. But now in, in capitalism, there's no more direct domination. I'm not being directly dominated by another person. I'm being dominated by the commodity that I produced, who, who when I bring to market, my only hopes is having the labor that I expended upon it validated as part of the sum total of society's labor. This, this domination then is a direct result of private production and not knowing if my individual labor is gonna be accepted. And this is also why the veil of fetishism is not just a veil, it, it's not just a veil to be lifted, right? Like even if I understand how this all works, even if I know value is an, an inherent property, I still have to produce for value. I still have to try my best to validate my individual labor, right, in order to survive. So then Marx concedes something that I think also gives us a hint about what he's trying to do. He says, political economy has indeed analyzed, however incompletely, value and its magnitude, and it has discovered what lies beneath these forms, aka labor, right? Because it's not original that the, the idea that labor is the, the content of value, right? Ricardo believed that, Smith to uh, some degree believed that, although his theory of value was a little wavy. Um, but he, Marx states that the classical political economists, they figured out that, that labor was behind value, but they never asked why labor is represented by the value of its product and why labor time is represented by the magnitude of that value. And the reason for this is that the bourgeois political economists took this for granted. They took for granted the fact that production takes place by private producers producing without any conscious plan. And this is exactly what Marx was able to, to uncover. And this was the basis of his critique of political economy as a field. So it was a field that saw private production to be as much as a self-evident necessity imposed by nature as productive labor itself. Adam Smith starts with, you know, human beings, they have a propensity to truck and barter. And that's taken as a starting point as much as it is as much as it is the fact that humans need to perform labor at all. And it's on this critique, this critique of private production, that Marx built upon in the rest of capital. It's on this concept of domination of the products of the producers over the producers and the fetishism of the commodity that Marx continues to build upon. So finally, right, to close out this presentation, I'm going to read one last quote, and it is Marx's effort to give us a description of what directly social common labor would be, a vision of communism, and the exact antithesis of the private production of individuals for value, which we see in capitalism. So he says, let us now picture to ourselves, by way of change, a community of free individuals carrying on their work with the means of production held in common, in which the labor power of all the different individuals is consciously applied as the combined labor power of the community. All the characteristics of Robinson's labor are here repeated, but with this difference that they are social instead of individual. Everything produced by him was exclusively the result of his own personal labor, and therefore simply an object of use for himself. The total product of our community is a social product, one portion serves as fresh means of production and remains social, but another portion is consumed by the members as means of substance. subsistence. A distribution of this portion amongst them is consequently necessary. The mode of this distribution will vary with the productive organization of the community and the degree of historical development attained by the producers. We will assume, but merely for the sake of the parallel with the production of commodities, that the share of each individual producer in the means of subsistence is determined by his labor time. Labor time would, in that case, play a double part. It's apportionment in accordance with a definite social plan. Definite social plan. Maintains the proper proportions between the different kinds of work to be done in the various wants of the community. On the other hand, it also serves as the measure of the portion 
of the common labor borne by each individual and of his share in the part of the total product destined for individual consumption. The social relations of the individual producers with regard both to their labor and to its products are in this case perfectly simple and intelligible and with that regard not only to production but also to distribution. And that is chapter one of Capital, which I hope was made somewhat clear by that.